You know, tell us about your early years. Okay, so, um, so I'm a Wiradjuri woman. I was born in Leeton, New South Wales. My mum's Aboriginal and my dad's white Australian with a Scottish heritage. So Urquhart or Urquhart, mm -hmm. that's where the Loch, Me Loch Ness monster is supposed to be. Um, so yeah, so I was born in Leeton and so was my mum and my grandmother. So we have a long line there. Mm -hmm. And my mum was actually part of the Stolen generation. So she mm -hmm. was taken from her parents when she was 11. And um, she was a domestic servant, so she was trained in the homes to serve people. And she ended up in Canberra until she was 18. So from the age of 14 to 18, she was a domestic. And then um, from 18, she went back to Leeton, met my father and was married. And so I'm one of six children. And then when I was around four years old, my parents separated and we were taken to a Catholic nunnery in Gosford, so King mm. Yeah, so that was the start of my childhood, I suppose. And um, yeah, so essentially the six of us were put into the homes from the age of four. And um, we were in there for a couple of years and then my dad took us out and took us to Kerrang, Victoria. And so um, I have quite strong memories of the homes and what happened and how we were treated. And also um, the nuns used to want to have respite, like um, arrest from us. So we'd get fostered out around through Gosford um, over the weekends and things like that. So that was sort of, all that was pretty traumatic and mm. not knowing where our parents were. And yeah, so that was kind of the start of my life up until I was six. So when you look, look back on that, it is traumatic. Like mm. it just, it's a kind of trauma that continues to you know, influ influence you. Yeah, it does. Um, it does in some ways, but essentially it's kind of, now it's kind of like my tools, mm -hmm. like it's my equipment now and how I navigate my life. So even though it was um, traumatic and it wasn't right, there's things in it now that I use in my everyday life. Like it has made who I am, yeah. um, but it's essentially... Um, through God and his healing and his plan and purpose for me, I've sort of become an overcomer yeah. in those circumstances, even yeah. though it doesn't remove the responsibility yep. of the people that, yeah, so. Going back into your story, you went to, to Kerrang in Victoria? Yeah, yeah, so I was um, six when we went there. So my father got us out um, and took us to Victoria. I have quite a thick file actually um, from Department of Community Services and Human Services that I got a few years ago. So everything's recorded, like, mm. and so um, I think my dad took us out for a re weekend release, but he didn't take us back. And so the, in the papers, it says how they're trying to find us. And so my dad actually took us to a little place called Nye West initially. And um, we were out on this farmhouse and it didn't have electricity. And we were there for a short time um, in pretty bad poverty. So my dad went into Kerrang to get a Centrelink payment, like a sole parent. And through that process, he was given a housing commission. And so, this, so he had the six of us, so he's white, we're Aboriginal. Um, so we go to, to Kerrang and um, essentially from the age of six, I grew up on the welfare. And so we, we always had a welfare person that, and sort of department, I suppose, that would come and check that our house was clean and that we had food and we went to school. Um, but our house wasn't that clean and we did go to school, but we didn't have much food because um, my dad was an alcoholic. And so, um, yeah, so from the age of six, we lived in Kerrang up until I was 10. And then when I was 10, my dad actually moved us to Robinvale, so into Sunraysia, so on the Murray and um, for work. And initially we stayed in a caravan, which is six kids and a, an adult male in a caravan is pretty full on. Yeah and um, I was down near the river and then we got a house in town and I grew up in Robinvale from the age of 10. Mm. And uh, Robinvale is an interesting town. There's a lot of Aboriginal followers and um, there is not like non-Indigenous people there. And um, so from the age of 10, like Robinvale, they kind of work hard, drink hard, fight really hard. <laughs> and so I sort of grew up in a pretty violent town from yeah. the age of 10. And then, um, like, Robinvale was a town in, so it's still the 70s, and Aboriginal people were still fruit pickers kind of thing. Like, we weren't, like, I knew from a very young age why well, I thought that I wouldn't get a job in town and I wouldn't get to this. So I already had a sense of hopelessness 
about myself as an Aboriginal mm. by the time I was 13. And a part of that was like being in the homes and going through schools and being in foster care, I would hear a lot of things about myself as an Aboriginal. So I would hear like no hopa, abo coon, black bludger, half caste, quarter caste, one eighth. And so I remember even teachers talking to me about my percentage, like you're a quarter caste, you're a half caste. And so I kind of grew up from a very young age thinking that my future didn't, wasn't going to amount to, to too much. So that's why I left school at 13. I, I thought, why would I need to be here yep. when I'm not going to get anywhere? And so I left at 13 and then I left home at 14. 14 is yeah. pretty young to move out of home and get into yeah, the world. that's hectic. How did you survive? Uh, so not very well. So um, I met um, a boy, which is crazy because I've got four kids. And so I met this um, young Aboriginal fella and I ran away with him and I went to Melbourne. And so we were squatters. And so Fitzroy, the big housing commission there. Yeah, so we um, lived there probably for around 10 months in and around Melbourne. And so I just ate out of soup kitchens and um, got money off the winos, like the fellas that drank in the park. And uh, it was like, Melbourne's not a really good place to be homeless. Mm. Like here it's beautiful, um, like the weather. Um, but my partner at the time, he was quite abusive. So he broke my sternum and just kind of made a mess of me for about 10 months. And through that time I had to get medical treatment for something else and they saw that I had bruises and so they rang Department of Community Services, it would have been hum Human Services back then and uh, through that process I took off like I ran away from him and I was only, I'd just turned 15 and then um, I don't know, welfare found me and I was picked up and taken down to Warrawa College, a school outside of Melbourne at Hillsville. And so I was 15, I had been homeless for a year and a half, arrived there and the whole time I was there, I was only there for about six weeks, I didn't feel well. And so what had happened was I'd actually arrived there pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I remember, so I, I didn't know I was pregnant. I remember the principal coming in, like I was called to the office. I went and sat in there and then she walked in and she was one of the original sapphires. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So um, she was very glamorous. She always wore high heels, and I never seen an Aboriginal lady like that. Anyway, so I just remember her heels coming in, and um, yeah, she told me I was pregnant, and so and I was fifteen. So then I I got picked up. It was really scary because um, a person I didn't know picked me up, took me back to Robinvale, and by that stage my dad didn't have our our housing commission anymore. So he was living in a chicken coop, so out in the fruit block. And so I lived in a chicken coop for a time. And um, this is as a f pregnant 15. 15 year old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it's like it was big for chickens, essentially. Um, <laughs> okay, for people. So we had two beds in there and we actually had a stove in there, which again is not, not safe. But so we were out in the fruit block and but it had a, a drop toilet and the shower was under the water tank. And so I didn't want to stay there. I thought people could see me in the shower mm. and stuff. I was quite so I moved back into Robin Bale, but I didn't have anywhere to live. So I just slept at anyone's houses right through my pregnancy. So I slept on the floor a lot. And then um, probably a month before I was due, I had to go and have an ultrasound over at Mildura Base Hospital. And my older sister came with me and while I was in there, I started feeling quite ill, like really sick. And um, we came back to Robin Bale. We were coming back to the doctors to give them the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But while we were there, like doctors and nurses came in at, at Mildura. And um, anyway, so they sent us back. They told us to go back and give the information to the doctors, gave them the information. And then as we're walking out, the nurses come and grabbed us and taken us back in. And so um, my son had died, so, and, and I was eight months pregnant. And so then from there, I had to wait more than a week, which is full mm. on, um, to then go into Majura and then have him. And then I brought him back and had a funeral. 
And um, when I went to the hospital, I didn't have any parents with me and I was 16. And so, and the hospital wanted to keep him. I don't, I don't know what that, if that was common practice mm. or whatever, but I, I argued with the hospital to release him. And then um, I took him home and had a funeral. And so, so I was only 16 and I'd been homeless and had a lot of abuse and alcoholic home, no mother. So a lot of things had happened to me by the time I was 16. Mm.